Hi everyone, I hope you're all keeping well. Uh, thank you for joining us today uh, for the first in our series of online travel events. Um, some of you already know me, I'm Ravel, one of the co-founders of Travel the Unknown. Um, I guess in these surreal times, um, it's given us a great opportunity at least to reach out to uh, more clients and more of you around the country and abroad. And uh, I've been delighted at the level of interest that we've had uh, for this talk and I'm confident that you'll find it insightful as well. It's great to have Sophie, Sophie Ibbotson again uh, with us uh, to talk about Uzbekistan. Some of you may have heard her before at one of our events. Um, she is the tourism ambassador for Uzbekistan in the UK. Um, and she's also the Brad Guide author to Uzbekistan as well. She will give you a flavor of Uzbekistan, what it has to offer, its culture, its history, its people, and why it should be one of your next must-see places once we're able to travel more freely again. So I just want to go over the format of today and uh, some gen general housekeeping rules. Um, first of all, I'll give a brief introduction about Travel the Unknown, and then I'll hand over to Sophie to talk 20 to 25 minutes about Uzbekistan. There will be time for Q&As afterwards, um, but um, because there's gonna be so many people on this call, um, we're gonna do this via chat. So for those of you using a laptop or a desktop computer, you should see a chat icon at the bottom of your screen. For those of you using a tablet or a mobile, you may have to access the chat option via the participants button, depending on what kind of device you're using. So while the talk is going on, if you have a question, um, if you go via the chat and then message the host, it should say travel the unknown host, if you send a message to that, then I will be able to go through the questions and then at the end of the session, uh, we'll try to answer as many questions as we can in the time we have available. Of course, I'm fully aware that um, COVID-19 is 24 seven in the news and some of you will have natural, naturally have questions about this. Um, you know, ultimately, you know, it'll dictate as to when, where and how we're gonna travel in the future. However, the talk is focused on Uzbekistan as a destination, so it'd be good if questions relate to Uzbekistan uh, for those purposes. Again, given how many are on this talk, um, mics are muted, um, and it would be good if they remain muted throughout. And same would be if you could disable your video, if you've enabled your video, if you could disable that, please. It'll help ensure that we maintain kind of a good audio and video quality throughout the call. We are at the mercy of technology, so please bear with us if there are any technical glitches. If your picture freezes or if the audio suddenly stops, it should hopefully come back fairly quickly. All right, so over to the, to start the presentation then. So a little bit about Travel the Unknown. Um, we run small group tours, uh, it's a maximum of 12 people. Uh, we also run tailor-made and private tours as well, so we can customize trips for you. Um, virtually all the tours that we've set up, we have very close hand, first hand intimate knowledge of. Um, our team have been out of these destinations set up, these incredible itineraries that we have. Um, over the years, we've developed excellent relations with our partners. Um, so, and we believe we have some of the most passionate, knowledgeable guides around. Um, we've been recommended in major guidebooks, as you can see. Um, and in today's climate, you know, we are fully financially protected and at all bonded. Right. I'm pleased to say that we did win the British Travel Awards in 2018 um, and last year we got the Runners Up Award, Bronze Awards. Um, might be a bit trickier to win it this year um, given the restrictions on travel um, but we'll see you next year. And this, this slide just shows some of the tours that run through Uzbekistan, uh, some of the group tours that we have. So we have a five stand Odyssey trip that takes in the five countries in Central Asia. We have a Silk Road through the stands that focuses on the Silk Road, essentially, and Uzbekistan is very much at the heart of that. We have an Uzbekistan-only tour, or Uzbekistan Odyssey tour, uh, for those who want to spend more time in Uzbekistan. And again, we can obviously customize these trips kind of, you know, for private, for private purposes. And again, some nice extension ideas that we have. One can cross into Tajikistan from Uzbekistan and do some village walks. And we have a Navoy extension. And for those interested, more interested in food, we have some culinary options as well. And again, there's more information on our website. All right, um, so I hope you've got a, a nice cup of tea, coffee, or even better, glass of wine. Um, and I'm gonna hand over to Sophie, who will take you on a journey through Uzbekistan. Over to you, Sophie. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome this evening. I'm very grateful to Rahul and the team at Travel the Unknown for hosting me and for giving me the chance to relive some of my favourite travel memories from the Silk Road whilst we're in lockdown. I thought this evening that I might take you on a virtual tour of Uzbekistan's highlights, 
introducing you to some of my favourite places one by one. But then I threw that idea out the window. I hope that soon enough you'll have your own tour guide in Uzbekistan and be able to see these wonders with your own eyes. What I'm going to do instead is try to inspire you and explain why it is that Uzbekistan is such great importance, historically, culturally and geopolitically. You might well pick up on some pub quiz answers. Did you know, for example, that Uzbekistan is one of only two doubly landlocked countries in the world? Hopefully I can give you some slightly meatier insights as well. I've already mentioned in passing the Silk Road, and that's where my story must begin. There never was just one Silk Road, but rather hundreds of different routes crisscrossing the Eurasian mountains, deserts and steppe between Europe and China. Right in the middle of it all was Uzbekistan, whose cities grew rich on the profits of overland trade. Silk was traded here, certainly, but so too were far more profitable goods, precious metals and jewels, spices and tea, textiles and dyes, artworks, cutting-edge technology, camels and horses, and more. Along with these goods, Silk Road travellers, the merchants, missionaries, soldiers and spies, carried new ideas. Zoroastrianism, Buddhism, Judaism, Confucianism, and later on Christianity and Islam, all spread along the Silk Roads. And in many places, their ideas became entwined with local traditions that were quite unacceptable to the orthodoxy. Uzbekistan's great cities, in particular Samarkand, Bukhara and Kiva, were centres of learning and intellectual debate. Their medieval scholars pushing boundaries in astronomy, philosophy, medicine and theology. Many of their theories, their calculations, would not be approved upon until the invention of the computer, such was the breadth and sophistication of their knowledge. People may tell you that the Silk Road ended with the navigation of intercontinental maritime routes or the arrival of the railways in the late 1800s. But though these developments diverted some of the trade, Central Asia and Uzbekistan in particular carried on with business as usual. The region lost none of its strategic importance either as the Imperial Russian and British empires competed with one another for influence and on occasions direct control. Rudyard Kipling invented the term great game, the tournament of spies, to describe the dance of minor aristocrats, diplomats and military officers travelling here under the pretense of exploration, surveying, map making and big game hunting. The local Khans, it should be said, were rarely fooled and frequently had the last laugh. Two British officers, Connolly and Stoddart, famously met a sticky end on the executioner's block in Bukhara and they weren't the only ones. The borders of Uzbekistan which you see today are somewhat artificial 20th century constructs. The Amudarya, the Oxus River of Antiquity, does form a natural border with Afghanistan in the south, but the lines in the sand, or the mountains, between Uzbekistan and its other neighbours are not so naturally placed. The reasons for this are manyfold, including linguistic and cultural divisions, the hard-won territories of different khanates, and the divide and rule policies of Joseph Stalin. What you will appreciate travelling within Uzbekistan, however, is that in spite of being united within a single nation state, different parts of the country retain their distinct identities. Samarkand and Bukhara in particular take great pride in being ethnically Tajik, their populations of Persian descent, or at least Iranian speakers. Cyrus the Great, the Achaemenid king of ancient Persia, died in battle not far from the Aral Sea, and his successors formed the Bactrian, Sogdian and Tokarian states which would control Central Asia for centuries to come. Alexander the Great married Roxana, a uh, daughter of a Bactrian chief, and both he and his troops left their genetic marks on the local population. It was the Arabs who first brought Islam to Central Asia in 649, and when they defeated the Chinese at the Battle of Talas a century later, their preeminence was assured. For the next five centuries, Uzbekistan was controlled by the Abbasid Caliphate. Arabic was the language of government and literature. Islam replaced Zoroastrianism as the dominant faith. And art, science and architecture blossomed, in part due to links with the scholars and artisans of Baghdad, 
Cairo and Cordoba. Other communities within Uzbekistan have definite Turkic roots, and these do predate the arrival of Genghis Khan and the Mongols. Karakhanid nomads from the northern steppe overran Uzbekistan in 999, and the Seljuks pushed east here from their capital at Merv in what is now Turkmenistan. It was the Mongols who finally broke Arab hegemony, however. And though Genghis Khan initially looked to Uzbekistan as a trading, pat as a trading partner, the battle lines were swiftly drawn when his mercantile caravans were killed. Mongol forces seized and decimated Samarkand and Bukhara, leaving them as virtual ghost towns. Thousands of people perished. In Samarkand, only 50,000 out of an estimated population of one million people survived. Pyramids of severed heads were raised as a sign of victory. In Termiz, in the southern part of Uzbekistan, the entire population was killed and perhaps a million people were slaughtered in a similar bloodbath in Urgench in the west. You're getting a crash course in Uzbekistan's history for me because it explains not only how strategically important this territory was in the ancient and medieval worlds, but also why the country has such a fascinating level of ethnic and cultural diversity today. If you stand a while in any of Uzbekistan's markets, and Chorsu Bazaar in Tashkent is especially good for this, You'll see not only Uzbeks, but also Tajiks, Kyrgyz, Kazakhs, ethnic Russians, Tatars, Uyghurs and Han Chinese. Developments in the 20th century brought Volga Germans, Poles, Ukrainians and Koreans, and a significant Afghan population has crossed the border too. The term melting pot is, is really overused, but it aptly describes Uzbekistan's cultural syncretism. Nowhere is the fusion of styles and designs more evident than in the Timurid era buildings of Samarkand, which are arguably the most fantastic sites in all of Uzbekistan. Emperor Amir Timur, who's known in the West as Tamerlane, made Samarkand his capital in 1370. His Timurid empire was the largest the world had ever seen, stretching from Damascus to Delhi. He wanted to build a city which would be the physical manifestation of his power, a reflection of his sophistication and taste, and would leave an architectural legacy which could not be forgotten. Timur had at his command an entire empire's worth of engineers, architects, artisans and labourers. He sought out the very best of these and brought them to Samarkand. Structures such as the Bibi Khanu Mosque, one of the largest mosques in the Islamic world, were truly international affairs and their construction pushed Timurid engineering to its limits. Skilled workmen designed and built a 41 metre high cupola and Indian elephants were purportedly used for the transportation and heavy lifting of the stones. The original bronze gates, which were later stolen by the Persian ruler Nadir Shah, rung out when struck. The vast courtyard here was floored with marble on which worshippers knelt and prayed. There were 400 marble pillars and the interior was decorated with painted papier-mâché, an invention which came from Kashmir. Legend has it that Bibi Khanum, the wife of Timur after whom the mosque was named, was beheaded, but in fact she outlived her husband by four years and was then poisoned by one of her own daughters. When her body was excavated from its grave in the 1950s, it was remarkably well preserved. She had been buried wearing expensive jewellery, which is now in the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. And this was a nod to her Mongol heritage, as it was not an Islamic practice. More recent, but no less fascinating, at least for me, is the Sitarai Mohikosa, the summer palace built just outside Bukhara by the last Emir, Muhammad Alim Khan, in 1911. Imperial Russia had exerted influence on the Emirates of Bukhara since the mid 19th century, though the Emir remained nominally independent. Surviving photographs such as this one here show Alim Khan as a Maharaja-like figure. He's bedecked in silk and jewels. The Bolsheviks would malign him as an oriental despot, a relic of the past, but in his mind he was a modern ruler with an international outlook and experience. He had studied for three years in St Petersburg, focusing on governance and military techniques. Early on in his reign, he did attempt to introduce reforms, albeit not those which might undermine his authority. The design of his palace, the Sitaro Mohikosa, mirrors the dominant forces in Alim Khan's own life and rule. 
Of the two main buildings which you see here, one is in the fashionable Russian style of the era, and the other is a traditional Bukharan building, complete with an open veranda. The furniture, the chandeliers, and the style of the banqueting hall would not have looked out of place in a palace or stately home in early 20th century Europe. But the requirement to house the emir's concubines, of which there were many, is definitely local, and the white hiring building is within the palace gardens. It's said that the emir used to select his companion for the night by throwing her an apple. The girl had to catch it and then take a bath in donkey's milk before being permitted to enter the royal bedchamber. That kind of lifestyle clearly wasn't compatible with the modern world and it wouldn't survive the upheaval to come. When the Russian Revolution happened and the Red Army came to Bukhara, the Emir fled to Afghanistan. The first Congress of the Bukharan Soviet was held in the courtyard of the palace. A new era for Uzbekistan had begun. I want to talk to you a little bit about Uzbekistan and the Soviet Union because although it was a period of extreme upheaval, political and cultural repression and brutality, communism changed Uzbekistan beyond any recognition. In 1920, Uzbekistan was a collection of medieval feudal khanates, which were fairly isolated from the rest of the world. In just 70 years, Uzbekistan became a single country, industrialized and built strong economic, political and cultural ties not only with Moscow, but with every part of the USSR, from Eastern Europe to the Pacific Ocean. Modern, independent Uzbekistan's development is built upon the foundations laid down during the Soviet period. There is a certain amount of nostalgia for the Soviet Union, especially amongst older people, who recall with rose-tinted spectacles guaranteed employment, ease of movement within the USSR, and the pride which came with belonging to a superpower. The Soviet ghosts are fading, but they haven't been eradicated entirely. The art and architecture of the period contrasts with that of earlier centuries in every way, its style, its purpose and its materials, but I'm fascinated by the juxtapositions. If you haven't travelled on the metro, for example, you haven't seen Tashkent. For me, it's one of the city's greatest attractions. Built after the devastating 1966 earthquake which levelled much of the city, each station on the metro network is unique. Uzbekistan's leading architects and artists blended Soviet modernism with classic Islamic styles. Alishan Navoy station, which you see here, is named after the great 15th century poet. On the walls are seen from his famous stories, set beneath gorgeous mosque-like zones. Cosmonaut station is space-themed. There are oil paintings of the Soyuz space capsule, as well as portraits of Yuri Gagarin, and Valentina Tereshkova, the first man and woman in space. At Go Gofo Gulom station, it's all giant spotlights and Art Nouveau columns coloured in malachite. If you don't mind being deprived of daylight, you could ride the metro all day, hopping on and off at every station to admire the exquisite work. Uzbekistan's ancient and medieval monuments received very mixed treatment in the Soviet period. Some were demolished, others were converted for alternative use. This was particularly true for religious buildings, the mosques, mausoleums and madrasas or religious schools. In Bukhara, for example, the 16th century Kulkadash madrasa was for a time a hotel and also a women's centre. Namangan's Mullah Kyrgyz madrasa became a literary museum. The elegant Toron mosque in Magalan was used as a jail and then as an office, returning to its original use only in 1992. Other buildings, ravaged over time by earthquakes, invaders and the weather, were rescued from the brink of destruction and restored. The Bibi Kanu Mosque and the Shari Zinja Necropolis, both of which are in Samarkand, are scarcely recognisable today. They've been raised phoenix-like from piles of dust and rubble. This approach to architectural conservation is not without its critics. Hardly anything that you see at the Bibi Kanu here is original. It dates from the rebuild in the 1970s. You do, however, have much more of a feel of what it would have been like when it was new, the scale of the tiled portico and the striking impression that it must have left on early visitors. I want to allow plenty of time for Q&A, so I'm going to end here with four things you absolutely have to do whilst you're in Uzbekistan, and I think all of the itineraries that travel the unknown have will give you opportunity to do these. 
First and foremost, you have to meet local people. Uzbeks, Tajiks, Kazakhs, Tatars, Karakalpaks, and many more. The monuments and the ruins can only tell you so much about a country. It's the people who will make you fall in love with the place, and you'll be swept up in the warmth of their hospitality. The younger generation in particular often speak excellent English, and they're very keen to engage with visitors and practice their language skills. You'll get a personal, honest perspective from them on what modern life is like in Uzbekistan. And if you're invited into someone's home for a cup of tea or a meal, it'll be one of the highlights of your trip. My second instruction is to eat. Everybody knows that calories don't count on holiday. In any case, you'll be walking a lot, so it will burn them off. The national dish, which many travellers describe as their favourite, is plov. It's a sticky, slow-cooked rice dish with shredded carrots, beef and roasted bulbs of garlic. Every region has its own variation, so you'll have the perfect excuse to try it several times to see which type you prefer. You may also have the chance to make it yourself during a cookery workshop. You should also eat samsa, which is Uzbekistan's answer to samosas, which are often stuffed with pumpkin, green noodles covered and flavoured with dill, and soft warm bread will accompany every meal, as will numerous fresh salads and endless pots of tea. Uzbekistan's winter melons are so delicious that the Financial Times recently ran an entire feature story about them, and in the summer months you can feast on sweet strawberries, cherries, apricots and more. I've talked this evening only about Uzbekistan's cities, but I also highly encourage you to get out into the rural areas and explore. Kiva is surrounded by the Kizilkum Desert, where you can ride camels, stay in a yurt and sleep out beneath the stars. From Samarkand and Bukhara, you can easily reach the Narata Kizilkum Biosphere Reserve in Navoy. There's some wonderful hiking there and also some great ecotourism initiatives in the villages. And Tashkent region around the capital has some spectacular mountains. They're the western extension of the Chan Shan range, which extends through Kyrgyzstan as well. I was fortunate enough to ski in Uzbekistan for the first time in February and can say hand on heart that the powder is the best I've had anywhere in the world. Um, last but not least, the instruction I have for you is that you should take your time. Travelling in Uzbekistan, you will see some of the most beautiful, most intricately decorated buildings anywhere in the world. Take the time to sit in the courtyards, stare up at the ceilings and marvel how anybody conceived, let alone built, such extraordinary sites and then reflect on the natural world around. It's humbling. You feel very small, but ever so grateful to be able to experience it in person. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sophie, uh, very much for that. Um, we do have a few questions that have come in. Um, first of all, I guess for those spending obviously significant time in Uzbekistan, um, what, how would you say the accommodation is generally the standard of accommodation in the country? The, the standard of accommodation that Travel the Unknown uses is very, very good. Um, there are a small number of international hotels in Tashkent, including now hotels by Hyatt, uh, Marriott, Radisson and Hilton. Um, and then elsewhere in the country, it would be local, local hotels. Um, and then sometimes the opportunity to try some quite different accommodation. You might, for example, choose to stay in a yurt one night, either in the desert or up in the mountains. Um, in Kiva, two of the historic madrasas have been converted into boutique hotels. And in the old city of Bukhara as well, there are a number of traditional houses which have been converted to small guest houses. Um, so there's a huge variety of accommodation, um, which will give you a very different perspective on Uzbekistan. Okay, thanks Sophie. Um, some more questions, quite a few questions coming in now. Um, meeting people, like what are the most accessible social environments? Um, is a bar scene available in Tashkent or other major cities? There, there is a bar scene in, in Tashkent. Um, actually, most people don't tend to go to bars, they tend to go to restaurants. Um, and restaurants serve alcohol and often have space for dancing as well. And that's more popular than going to somewhere solely for drinking. Um, in terms of meeting people out and about, wherever you stop, people will come up and chat. And that replies whether you're stood in the courtyard of a mosque, whether you're wandering through the market, whether you're sat in a park, there will always be people smiling, waving and coming up to chat and engage you in conversation. Great, good. Um, and would you recommend the Savitsky Museum and is the RLC area worth visiting? So the Savitsky Museum is my absolute favourite museum in 
the entirety of Central Asia, and it's in Nukas in the far west of Uzbekistan. And it's incredibly famous because it has the world's second largest collection of avant-garde, Russian avant-garde art, including a lot of paintings by artists who were purged by Stalin. Um, it's been featured in, in The Guardian and a lot of other publications. If you have the opportunity to go, I highly recommend it. However, it is difficult to get to. Nukas is, is stuck out on its own in Karakapakistan in the northwest of Uzbekistan. And unless you are going to go there from Kiva, um, it's, it's going to be time consuming to get to and from. Um, the Aral Sea, again, um, even getting from Nukas up to the, the Aral Sea is a, a long and slow drive. Um, more and more people are doing it, particularly if they're interested in either disaster tourism or in the environmental, uh, rest well, first of all, the environmental disaster and then the environmental restoration, which is now going on. Um, but it's quite a niche thing to do. And you would need to allow several extra days on the length of your trip to go up to the Aral Sea and come back again. Okay. I mean, have you been skiing yourself in Uzbekistan and how easy is it? To I, get I have. I, I skied there in uh, February this year for the first time. Um, I skied at two of the old Soviet era resorts and also at the brand new Amisoy resort. Um, I wouldn't recommend the older resorts, but the Amisoy resort um, is being run by uh, an Andorran company and they have brought in a management team from Europe, including the former director of Courchevel. Um, to run the resort. So it's being done to the highest international standards. The quality of the snow is fantastic. Uh, they've got brand new lifts and they're having more lifts put in this season um, and also additional hotel accommodation. So if you want a, a quirky place to ski that's got superb powder and some great off-piste as well as some interesting pisted runs, Uzbekistan is fantastic. <laughs> great, no, sounds great. And um, yeah, another question that we've just uh, got in that just come in is how is Uzbekistan for people with limited mobility uh, in terms of visiting the monuments? Um, it depends which monuments you're talking about. Most of the mosques are fairly accessible for people with low, limited mobility. Um, there is generally, um, you can get a vehicle quite close and there's generally good paving um, to the mosque and madrasas. The site which I would say is a notable exception is the Shai Zinda, which is the big necropolis in Samarkand and that's because it's accessed via um, a big flight of stairs. Um, so most sites are accessible but not all of them and if you do have particular mobility issues it's worth checking the tour operator before um, because there may be certain sites which are less accessible and you may just want to replace them with something else on your itinerary. Yeah, I mean, sometimes that has happened with us when people have uh, joint trips and they've got limited mobility and sometimes we'd recommend potentially doing a private trip. That way you can, you know, pick and choose which are the most kind of, you know, appropriate sites to visit. Um, but uh, yeah, absolutely, just check with us um, and, you know, we'll be able to advise accordingly um, as well. Um, Jessica just asked, does train travel need to be pre-booked? Um, I guess if one's traveling alone um, in between cities, if so, where and when is best? Um, I can just maybe just say something before you, Sophie. Obviously, if you're on a group tour or if we've organized a tour, then obviously we would do that you know, on your behalf. But Sophie, say if someone is traveling independently to the country, what would your advice be for that? If you're traveling independently and want to go on the high-speed train, you need to book it in advance. The reason is that demand outstrips supply particularly in the high season and so if you don't book it in advance you won't get a ticket for the day that you want to travel however there are always slower services non-high speed trains um, and so if you do need to travel at short notice you can usually get on to one of the older slower services if not the bullet train okay right and barry's also asked um, i mean he apparently will have a day um from early morning through to kind of late evening and would like to do a trip to the rural surrounds of Kiva. What would be good and achievable to do in that time? Um, from, from Kiva, I would recommend taking a day trip out to the, um, uh, the Kor sorry, Khorezm castles, which are the, the desert castles uh, to the north of, of Kiva. Um, there are more than 50 of these in the desert, dating back several thousand years. And they're quite extraordinary structures. And if you go out to, uh, for example, the Ayas Kala, which is one of the larger um, fortresses, actually it's a, it's a series of, of three fortresses on one site. Um, there is also a yurt camp there. There are also camels there. 
And so you'll be able to get um, ancient history and ruins, uh, camels, landscape and a yurt camp all in all in one go. And that's within an easy day trip from, from Cuba. Okay, and another question is, uh, what is Uzbekistan like for women travellers? Um, it's a fantastic destination for women travellers, actually. And the feedback that we get from a lot of uh, my, my friends and colleagues who go is, it's unusual to feel this safe. Um, people assume because it's uh, a Muslim country, because it's a developing country, that they're going to feel unsafe, but actually this isn't the case at all. Um, it's very safe to go out in the evening on your own as a woman. It's very safe to use public transport um, as a woman and sort of street harassment, which you may find in some other destinations is, is a complete non-issue. Non um, I, I don't think I've ever heard of anybody saying that they were they were harassed um, as a woman was in Uzbekistan. And that's a really, really nice position to be in. You do feel very safe. Um, mm -hmm. People are very respectful. Uh, it's a very family orientated destination. Um, and so it's a, I think it's a great place for, for women to travel. Great. Um, and uh, Carl has asked, is a yurt visit worth it? <laughs> it's great. I, I love the yurt because of the novelty. I wouldn't want an entire holiday just staying in yurts because unless you have an ensuite yurt, the facilities are, are probably going to be a little bit basic. Um, but to spend one or two nights either in the desert or in the mountains in a yurt is a great deal of fun. Um, you see a different side of life. Often you'll get to see um, the traditional carpets and embroideries of uh, nomadic populations. You might hear uh, musicians, you might see dancers. Um, there's an opportunity to, to sit out in the desert to see the stars. The stargazing is fantastic and also to have a, a bonfire and it's a very, very different experience to this kind of thing that you'll experience when you're in the cities in Uzbekistan. Okay, another question is like, what kind of souvenirs, like what are the traditional souvenirs that one can pick up in Uzbekistan? Uzbekistan is really, really famous for its textiles, in particular for its silks. Uh, you may be able to see my, my jacket that I'm wearing now. This is uh, made in Uzbekistan and a, a traditional style. Um, two of the textile forms, Adras and Atlas, have got UNESCO intangible cultural heritage status. Um, another form of textile that's very, very popular as a souvenir and also to decorate people's homes in Uzbekistan is a Suzani, which is a traditional embroidery. Um, apart from the textiles, wood carving is um, still very, very popular. Um, ceramics, of course, not only can you buy tiles, but also tea sets, plates and other painted items. Um, in the Fergana Valley, uh, it's quite famous for its knives, uh, also for embroidered skull caps. So there's lots of handicrafts that you can buy. Besides that, Uzbekistan is a huge producer and exporter of dried fruits and nuts. So I usually end up bringing back bags and bags of dried apricots, almonds, pistachios, and these kind of things, which are another very tasty souvenir. Great. And in fact, you're talking of tasty. Um, David and Jayant have asked, um, how is Uzbekistan and Tashkent for vegetarian and vegan food? It's getting better. I think that is the best way to put it. Um, Uzbekistan's themselves, are yet to take on vegetarianism. Um, for them, they can't understand why anybody wouldn't want to eat meat because it's a, a very integral part to their, their culture and their national cuisine. However, they are recognizing that foreigners now are often um, vegetarian or vegan or have other dietary requirements. And thankfully, Uzbekistan is incredibly productive in its agricultural produce. There are huge amounts of fruit and vegetables available and therefore restaurants are starting to realise that vegetables can be a dish on their own. They can be the centre of meal. They don't have to just be a, a side dish to a, a great plate of meat. Um, if you travel in the summer in particular, you'll have fantastic selection of fresh produce and every meal, whichever restaurant you go into, whatever you order, is going to come accompanied by a huge range of different salads, as well as by fresh bread and tea. Um, so as a vegetarian, you won't ever go hungry. You just need to make sure that the restaurant knows, preferably in advance, but otherwise when you arrive, that you are vegetarian and you don't want meat as well. Sure. I mean, likewise, when someone books a trip with us, we do ask people's dietary requirements to make sure that they are catered for. Um, okay, another question is uh, from David. Is which 
which is the best season to see all the cityscapes? I personally really like November. Um, so I think the autumn and the spring are the, the best times to go. Uh, the reasons for this is the summer it gets very, very hot and it also gets very, very busy. Um, winter is fine, but it, it's, it's quite cold and it can be grey. But the spring and autumn, I think, are absolutely perfect times to travel. And November and March in particular tend to be quite quiet. Uh, yes, they are cooler, but you will still have blue skies and sunshine. And that really sets off the mm -hmm. architecture. Great. Um, Kathy's also asked, what's the optimum amount of time to spend in Uzbekistan? I mean, we, for example, have a, an Uzbekistan Odyssey tour. It's a very in-depth tour. It's a 14-day trip, which also takes in Nukus. Uh, I think uh, you've obviously mentioned that in the far west. And that's a very in-depth tour. Um, Sophie, any other kind of comments on, on that? I think the minimum you would want to spend in Uzbekistan is 10 days, um, but ideally two to three weeks. Um, so in two weeks, you can comfortably do Tashkent, um, go to Nukas and Kiva, and then back via uh, Bukhara, Samarkand, and possibly Shakhrasabz as well. If you have three weeks, you also have time either go down to Temiz on the Afghan border where there are some phenomenal archaeological sites or go east into the Fergana Valley which is the agricultural sort of bread basket of Uzbekistan and also has a, a number of cultural sites and a, a great handicrafts tradition. Okay, great. Um, and I guess this is a, a more kind of practical kind of border entry question and um, obviously we know that and with COVID-19 kind of going on there's a lot of uncertainty but do you have any, um, your own ideas in terms of the visa, you know, process for Uzbekistan? Is it likely to remain the same, you think, given that, you know, you work with the embassy to a certain extent? So currently, Uzbekistan is visa-free for 86 different nationalities. That includes uh, British passport holders and all EU nationals. So under normal circumstances, going in and out is very, very easy. You just turn up, show your passport at immigration, they stamp you in and that's it. Um, I think going forwards, when we are able to travel again, you still won't need a visa. I can't see visas being brought back in for Uzbekistan. There may be um, temperature checks. You may have to show proof of vaccination. Um, we don't yet know what those sorts of uh, travel requirements are going to be. But what we can expect is that Uzbekistan's requirements will be in line with other destinations, including the European Union, um, because they are getting very good at aligning their regulations with other international standards. Um, so I don't expect that Uzbekistan will be any more or less difficult to get into than uh, Europe or um, other similar destinations. And what's it, I mean, given that Uzbekistan is a large country, um, what is it like traveling around in terms of the transport, the roads, etc.? The high speed train is fantastic um, and that will take you from Tashkent to Samarkand to Bukhara and by the end of this year it will be able to go all the way to uh, Kiva as well and that will mean that you can travel very very quickly comfortably in air conditioned trains um, the, the entire width of the country. Um, if you're going beyond those destinations for example into rural areas you'll be on the roads Generally, the intercity roads are quite good and they have all been upgraded in recent years. If you want to get into the absolute back of beyond and, and go out into the desert or up to the mountains, um, it depends where you go. You may have uh, smaller, slower roads in not such good condition. Um, but generally, the, the transport infrastructure within the country is, is quite good. And certainly if you're on a tour, any vehicles that you're traveling in will be fairly new, well-maintained, um, and have air conditioning. Okay, um, and Dorothy has a question, can, what is Uzbekistan like for wildlife? Wildlife, I don't generally recommend Uzbekistan as a wildlife destination, it's not the selling point of the country, but if you are interested in wildlife there are certain sort of pockets and areas you can explore. Um, Navoy region, which I think you have an extension to, um, and particularly the Narata Kizil Biosphere Reserve, um, is quite an interesting area for birding. Um, Tudakul, which is one of the lakes there, is an uh, important birding area um, and it's a place particularly for migrant species when they're flying from Siberia down to uh, Iran and the Indian subcontinent for the winter um, or, or back uh, for the summer. Um, and so that is quite an interesting place in terms of bird life. 
Um, you also see in the mountain areas quite a lot of uh, raptors and other large birds of prey. Um, there are places within Uzbekistan where you can see mountain wildlife, including snow leopards. Um, but as anybody who has ever tried to spot a snow leopard will know, they are very, very good at hiding. Um, so although they are there, your chances of seeing them are, are quite slow. Okay, great. And possibly one kind of final question or um, is dress code in Uzbekistan, does one have to be covered up to visit the mosques or the build or monuments? Generally, no. Um, it's a it's a conservative country, but not an overtly religious country. So women aren't expected to cover their heads. Um, there's no strict dress code anywhere you go because the majority of mosques are considered as historic monuments as opposed to practicing places of worship. That said, I always think it's important to be respectful about where you go. Um, I wouldn't generally wear, wear shorts or, or sleeveless tops, particularly if I'm going into a mosque. Um, and also, I mean, you'd be able to see from looking at me I am very, very pale. If I go to Uzbekistan in the summer, when it is 40 or 45 degrees, I get terribly burned. And therefore having a, a scarf to sort of put over my head or protect the back of my neck and some sort of covering on my arms is important, not just in terms of um, uh, dress code, but also to protect yourself from the elements. So that's a consideration as well. And there is one other question I'm trying to sneak in now. Jayant has asked, can you please kind of tell us about sites in Termez? Um, Termez was a, or is, <laughs> um, very, very important pre-Islamic site in Uzbekistan. And so if you're interested in the Buddhist and Zoroastrian history of the Silk Road, this is the place to go. There are a number of um, very, very large archaeological sites spread out along the uh, Amudari River. One of these has recently been recognised as Alexandria on the Oxus, um, a city built by Alexander the Great. Um, the Uzbeks generally call it Kampiatepe, but Alexandria on the Oxus is what the site originally would have been when called. Um, there are also uh, Fires Tepe, which was a, a monastery site, um, Kirkes, which means 40, 40 girls, um, and refers to a legend of 40 girl warriors within Central Asia. Um, it's not known whether that site was a small fortress or sort of a caravanserai, um, but it, it's linked with that legend. And there were another number, um, I mean, we're talking dozens of very, very important sites around there. So if you're an archaeology geek like me, it's a fantastic place to go. Um, Termiz also has what's probably the best archaeology museum in Central Asia. Um, it's an unexpected place to find it, but because there were so many sites nearby, they wanted to build a, a world-class local museum to showcase some of the artefacts. Obviously, some of the um, archaeological finds during the Soviet period went to the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. Others are on display in the museums in Tashkent, but Temer's Museum itself is a, a beautiful museum with some excellent finds that are very, very well presented. Yeah, I mean, we also offer an arranged kind of extensions to Termez as well, one or two day extensions. Um, and there were a few people who, were, who had also asked about traveling to neighboring countries. Mm -hmm. um, as the earlier slide showed, we do do like a five stand trip. So you can visit all five stands or take in, you know, three countries on the Silk Road through the stands as well. So, and again, we can customize tours. So yes, if one has more time, it is advisable to obviously explore more of the region as well, uh, more, more, you know, more in Central Asia. So absolutely, that can be arranged. We're afraid we are out of time now. Um, so again, I'd just like to thank Sophie, thank you for making the time and, and for obviously inspiring us and hopefully everyone else into hopefully visiting Uzbekistan as soon as we can. Um, we will be sending a short feedback form after this talk as well, possibly tomorrow. It'd be useful for us. It's the very first time that we're doing one of these talks on Zoom. Um, so any feedback would be kind of very much appreciated. Um, we are going to be having another talk in a couple of weeks' time. Um, Diana Dark, who's also a Brat Guide author and a Middle East expert, is going to be talking about Eastern Turkey. Um, so that should also be fascinating. So hopefully, I have seen that most of many of you have signed up for that talk. Um, otherwise, you can go to our events page, and there's details there again to sign up for that. Uh, we are planning on bring, bringing in more speakers for some of the other destinations as well, and we will add those to the events page as and when they are scheduled. Um, we will also be posting a recording of this uh, talk on our website. It may take a few days, um, but yeah, do look out for that as well.
again, thank you all for attending. Hopefully the audio and the video was good enough. And again, thank you, Sophie, for, for your time. And thank you. Yeah, we'll be in touch. And I look forward to seeing you all in Uzbekistan. Great. Likewise. Thanks, Sophie. Thanks, Bye. Bye-bye.